we're going to get a start. And uh, thank you again for braving the, uh, the warmer uh, elements tonight. It is rather muggy. I think we're in Queensland. Except we don't have Queensland weather. Because what do they say? It used to be, what was it? Um, beautiful one day and perfect the next. Now it's wet one day and wetter the next or something. I don't know. Or underwater the next. So uh, we're not quite getting the rainfall we would like. We wouldn't mind a little bit of the, uh, the rainfall Queensland's getting, but we're not getting it. But uh, nevertheless, it's still quite balmy, quite reasonably enjoyable weather. We're going to do a very, what we like to call a rapid, now is that a bit too loud? Can you, is that too loud? Seems to be a bit loud to me, but if you're happy with it, I'm happy with it. Um, <clears throat> we're going to do what we call a, a, a rapid roundup in a moment as we talk about what we've done last week and the week before, so we can try and get a summary in our mind before we proceed and move forward. That the problem with doing seminars once a week, if you like me, you tend to easily forget what you've discussed and, and thought about, although I'm very pleased to know that John, for example, is, is, uh, is doing some study as he goes home and asking questions, and that's great. And we say, any of you, it doesn't matter who you are, if you've got questions, please ask us whether we, we may not be able to answer them exactly how you'd like them answered in the actual seminar session, but we will answer them after during supper. Uh, or alternatively, on the last night, we uh, hopefully will have a little question box. You can throw your questions in and we'll set aside 15, 20, 25 minutes if we're necessary to answer your questions. So that's what we do want to do. But what we do obviously need to do now is just go back over, recap what we have already learnt in our seminar sessions regarding Bible prophecy. And we keep saying this is an ancient king's dream, and it is. And these people are real people. They, um, oh, come on in, Maddie, Shannon, you're all right. <laughs> Your seats are saved here for you. Uh, we only just got started, so you only missed a couple of sentences. So there you go. Um, what we're trying to say is that we're dealing with real people, real events, real incidences that aren't only recorded here in the Bible, they are recorded in history books, where at least these uh, people that we're talking about, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, and Babylon, the empire, and all the subsequent empires that we've been dealing with. Um, you don't just have to go to the Bible to find out about those. You can go to history books and you'll find exactly the same information. They correlate beautifully together and they marry together with the dates and the chronology. So that's important to know. We're not just fabricating something out of a book that you don't know whether you want to believe in it or not. We're showing you from the Bible that matches in with history really beautifully well and that's very important that you understand that and we'll show you a little bit more proof about that in a moment so when we get to this uh, what we call a rapid review uh, particularly from last week we, we started dealing didn't we with Daniel chapter 2 it's a very important Bible prophecy that not only deals with past history it's going to show you and deal with history right up till today and beyond today so that's what makes it exciting. I know everyone goes, oh, well, you know, who cares about the history? You know, why worry about things that happened? You know, who cares about Alexander the Great and the Romans and the, you know, the Persians? Well, the idea is, of course, these are all stepping stones to show that what God prophesied way back there, you know, 2,600 years ago, what he prophesied then was stepping stones that would lead to our day. And each one of those stepping stones have come to pass. They've all been fulfilled with 100% accuracy and that's what we love so and that's what makes us really get excited about the Bible so when we talk about this prophecy that was uh, is 200 2600 years old you remember what the king saw he saw this very large image in his dream it was a it was a fearsome looking image of a of a man standing there you know we don't know exactly what it would have looked like except we do know the contour or the shape or the the, the makeup of this particular image and it it scared the living daylights out of the king he woke up in a cold sweat he must have because he remembered everything so vividly and he had this dream didn't he of this massive uh, warlike figure standing there perhaps arms folded looking down over the king as he laid in his bed and and all the king could remember was this fascinating makeup of this king of this particular image so I want you a bit of homework you hopefully you, you remember from last week and hopefully you did do some homework I want you to yell out to me what the medals were when I say and I'm not going to put them in order 
Legs. Iron. Iron. Chest. Silver. Oh, well done. Head. Gold. Gold. Feet. Clay and iron. Good. Fatma, very good. Clay and iron. And the belly and thighs. Brass. Well done. Good. Now I'm going to yell out again and you're going to tell me who they represented. Let's start with head. Very good. Oh, what did Fred say? <laughs> Feet. Good. It's a divided Europe because remember, we've got part iron, part clay. They are all intertwined together to form the, t the feet and the ten toes, but they don't mix. It's a pretty unstable environment, but nonetheless it's a formation of, a, uh, of, of something we can identify with. And of course, because it comes out of Rome, it's, it's really a divided Europe. Good. Sorry? The strength is definitely in the iron. Thanks, Ross. The strength is in the iron. And the clay is like the democratic people's voice, which we quite often see raising itself in the world today, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, but the, here we have the, the feet, part of iron, part of clay, quite uh, unstable, but getting on reasonably well. And that's a divided Europe of today. So we'll keep that one aside for a moment, because we'll talk about that in, in a subsequent um, seminar. Uh, the, uh, the legs. Brian. Well done, Jackson. Now you can't answer anymore because you've answered just about all of them. <laughs> That's right, Rome. Two legs. Yes, has gotcha. Constantinople. Yep. And Rome. Eastern and Western Rome because Rome was divided into two factions, two uh, political entities, if you like. And you have. Rome, of course, and you have Constantinople, the eastern and western powers of Rome, eventually all disintegrating and coming under another empire, still part of Rome, it wasn't a separate empire, but it was known as something else, the... I'll give the first word, holy. The Holy Roman Empire, which was predominantly the Catholic Church, which continue to, to, to basically take control of the entity of the, of the old Roman Empire. And there's your strength of Rome, by the way, today, because there's no Rome as far as political power is concerned at all today, but I tell you what, there's still a very, very strong element of Rome as the Holy Roman Empire. And that's what um, Ross was saying about with, with that iron strength of, of, uh, of Europe. So that's correct. Who can tell me what the belly and thighs? Which, which country was that? Wait a minute, Jackson. Anyone over this side? Belly and thighs? Any idea? The brass? Greece. 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 Well done. Greeks. Remember the brazen coated Greeks. Now I know Maddie and Shannon. Maddie, you'd remember a lot of this. Shannon, you're going to have to lean on Matty afterwards and he's going to teach you a little bit more because you weren't here, able to be with us last week. So we're, we're probably taking you to a little level that might mean, oh, what's this all about? So Matt, you've got some homework to do to tell Shannon all about this later. Uh, then, of course, we've got the, the, the chest and arms of silver. What's, what what uh, empire is that? Persia, exactly, which we know today as? Iran. Iran. Iran, Iran, exactly. We learned a little bit about Alexander the Great and how he was able to overcome the Persians. Uh, and of course, we then ended off last week with what else happened in that dream. So it's one thing to know that the king was told, King, king of Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. That's you, that represents Babylon, the great, mighty, wealthy uh, empire of Babylon. That's you, but guess what? After you is going to come another kingdom, a little inferior to you, but it will come and you can't stop it because God's ordained it will happen and that's in the form of the Persians. Then, then uh, Daniel said, and then after the Persians will come another kingdom, a little inferior again, but a very powerful entity on its own anyway and that's represented by the Greeks, by the brass, the bronze. And then will come the real iron strong power of Rome. Rome was never a hugely wealthy empire, not like Babylon, nothing like Babylon, but it was extremely strong. It was a very strong empire. 
and it ruled with an iron fist, and iron was a really good metal to, to describe Rome and how powerful it really was. And then, of course, there was no other world empire. Did you know that, by the way? There's been no world empire since the Romans. The Romans were the last uh, uh, chronicalised world empire this world has ever seen. Sure, we talk about the British Empire and the Byzantine Empire and, and the Spanish uh, 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 Empire, if they can claim they ever had one, and, and perhaps the French and, and, and Genghis Khan in Mongolia and so on, but they were never world empires. They certainly controlled a reasonable amount of, of ter ter territory, but they never conquered the then known armies of the world. So the Rome, Rome was the last empire to have existed. So Daniel's telling this to the king, and lo and behold, if history doesn't testify that everything that Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar happens in the exact order that he's just told him it would happen. And then when Rome would finally disintegrate and break up, there would be legacies of the ancient Roman Empire in the form of the Holy Roman Empire that will amalgamate with the people's voice, the clay, the democratic processes of the political system of Europe. And the two of them would amalgamate together in a, what I would have to say is a fairly unstable environment. And I don't think anyone here would disagree with how unstable Europe is at the moment. Probably more unstable than it's ever been in its history. And you've got countries that are living on the edge of financial collapse, well some of them already collapsed, Greece being one of them, Spain is virtually bankrupt, Italy is now just about bankrupt, uh, Portugal, it's a, they're, they're basket cases financially speaking, they're all in absolute trouble. But you've got the stronger countries, the Germanys, you know, trying to prop them up, France trying to prop them up, so you've got the iron and you've got the clay, you've got this integration of strong and weak countries that emanated out of the ten tribes that overthrew the Roman Empire, the ten toes, and there they are in a very unstable environment waiting for the next part of that dream. Now what was the next part of the dream? What happened next? What did the king see? And this is what really troubled the king. I believe it did anyway. What was the next part in that dream? Exactly, Joey. A stone was cut out of mountains, out of the mountains, without hands. Now lock that up in your mind. We're going to look this quote up in a minute. We're going to colour it in. It was cut out of mountains without hands. That's a very important statement. And that stone came hurtling across the, the, the valleys. There was mountains in the background. You could see this stone being cut out without hands. This massive big rock and it came hurtling across the valley towards this great image looking at the king and it, it comes and where does it strike that image? Does it strike it in the head? The feet. The feet. Right at that unstable part in history it strikes the feet. Well we want to know what that is all about. Now you might be asking yourself why doesn't God put it in plain terms? Why does it just say there's going to come Babylon, there's going to come the, the Persians, there's going to come the Greeks, there's going to come the Romans, and then we're going to have an unstable environment known as Europe. Why didn't he just write it in English so that you and I can understand there'd be no ambiguity? Ambiguity, is that the word? Ambiguity, I think that's the word. Why doesn't he just put it in terms that we can understand? Well, that's a very important quote. Because God wants us to think about it. And he wants us to delve into his scriptures and use history as a, as a point of reference to prove that everything he has said is accurate and true. And so he writes this in Proverbs 25. It is the glory of God to conceal things. So it's God's glory, his prerogative to write things in this book in a way that you and I have to delve in and understand and unravel it. He doesn't want to hand it to us on a plate. He wants people like you and me to sit down and say, I'm going to make this book a part of my life and I'm going to open it up and I'm going to study it and I'm going to try and absorb what God is saying and I'm going to check everything out that I read here with history, with what God has said, with other passages in scripture and if I can see what the answer truly is, then God says, you're like a king. It's the glory of kings to search out these matters. So that's why God does it this way. He puts it in a way that he wants people to put aside some time, which you've done, thankfully, tonight and in our seminars, to sit down, discuss it with each other, learn about it, check out for yourself, 
and come back with what is really the, the Bible is teaching us. So that's what we are doing in our seminars and that's exactly what God is doing. Now we've put this quote up on the, on the screen before, uh, but it is a very true one. Um, this is how King Nebuchadnezzar responded to that particular dream or the, or the interpretation of the dream from Daniel. So Daniel gives this great explanation because God gave him the explanation. And don't forget, when, God is, when Daniel's talking to the King Nebuchadnezzar, did he say, oh yes, I'm just like your smart soothsayers and your charlatans and crystal ball gaze, ga, ga, um, gazers and all the other uh, astrologers that you have in your particular uh, realm and kingdom. I'm just like them, so give me a big pat on the back and give me a few you know, million bucks and uh, elevate me in your kingdom because I'm the one that's giving you all this information. Daniel doesn't say that at all, does he, Jackson? Never says that. What, who does he give the... Who does he give the praise to? God. He said, I can't tell you anything except God reveals it to me. It's not me that's saying this, it's God using me to tell you. And that's why the king was so impressed and he said to Daniel, Surely your God is God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets. And Daniel was able to reveal that whole interpretation of the of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had with great clarity and it convinced the king. Just as a sideline, it convinced the king for a short period of time because the king was a very proud king. And he knew what Daniel had said was right and proper. That's why he was able to make that statement. But give it a few days, maybe a, a week or two, and he's thinking, I don't want my kingdom to come to an end. <laughs> why would I want my I'm the, I'm the, I am really the king of kings why would I want my kingdom to come to an end does anyone know what, what Nebuchadnezzar actually did yep he went and built an image uh, we can estimate was a very rough approximation of the image that he saw and made it all in gold absolutely right Caleb he got a, 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 uh, some of his architects together and builders together and said, look, I appreciate what Daniel said, but I've had time to think about it and I don't want my kingdom to come to an end. The interesting thing is he, he built the whole thing in a plain. I think it was called Juba, the plain of Juba. And the reason why he built it in a plain of Juba because there was no mountains that you could see anywhere around, so there was no chance of a stone being cut out of a mountain to come and strike that image. Quite amazing. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, he, he thought things through and said, OK, I'm going to build it, but I'm going to put it somewhere where there's no mountain, there's no stone going to destroy this, and this whole image is going to be of gold. So it, my kingdom is never coming to an end. And that was the incident, of course, where at a certain time of the day, uh, a, a decree would go out, like a siren would sound, and every Everybody had to drop to their knees and worship this image and we know that at least three, Daniel would have been a fourth, but we know at least three men didn't drop to their knees and worship the image and they were Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Some of you have probably heard of that. Yeah, they've got Hebrew names but that's their Babylonian names. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And they were the ones thrown into the fiery furnace because they didn't obey the king's order and we know they survived God was with them and they came out of that furnace that's just side just a little interesting story it's all in the book of Daniel so you can follow that through but isn't the king smart you know I'll, I'll build a king I'll build this image but I won't do it anywhere near a mountain because there's no way I want a stone to come out and destroy the image of course uh, we know that history is the it, prophecy is the mold into which history is poured and there was nothing the king was ever going to be able to do to prevent what God had said he was going to do now you might be saying well hang on a second Seriously, come on. The book of Daniel, a major prophecy in the Old Testament. The book of Isaiah, a major prophet in the Old Testament. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they're all what we classify as major prophecies or prophets of the Old Testament. How do we know they even were real writings? You know, th this was, this, I got a version here in the English called the King James Version. It was written in, or was translated in 1611. And King James authorised the, the, uh, the, um, the scribes of those days to trans, 
translate from the Latin into proper English because the only ones that had Bibles were those that had Latin. There were a few English Bibles getting around, but not many. Wycliffe, Tyndale had translated into English. But King James said, no, nah, enough's enough. Let's, let's translate the whole Bible, 1611. So people go, this, this book only goes back to 1611. How can you say the Bible is 2,600 years old? How do we know there was an Ezekiel? How do we know there was an Isaiah? You know, I mean, how do we know any of these things? Except, of course, they found proof. Found proof. Now, Lionel, you have been here. And me. And me. You and me. Who else has been in this area? Anyone else in the hall? The Qum Qumran, oh, Colin, back in there in the background. Uh, that's called the Qumran Caves. It's just about 30, 40 miles south of Jerusalem near the Dead Sea and it was in these caves in 1947 that they found the most amazing discovery. They say it's a modern day absolute marvellous archaeological find that you could ever begin to even imagine the significance of it. We can't begin to imagine except it does certainly support every bit we've been saying about the Bible. A young boy was throwing stones around. He was a shepherd boy in 1947. He was chucking stones up into the caves, and there's quite a few of them in this particular area. And he hears this rock hit this, this pottery pot. And he thinks, oh, that sounds like a, something's up there that I should investigate. So he leaves his sheep down below, and he climbs up the side of the cliff, and he gets into these caves here, and he finds these cylindrical cylinders of pottery in which he opens them up, and there are the most amazing handwritten scrolls which he never knew what they were. And the sad thing is, unfortunately, neither did his Bedouin tribe and the Arabs, and they didn't know what they were, and they started dissecting them all and start selling them off to different people for bits of money, not realising the significance of these particular scrolls, until in the end, people that found out about it in the know said, let's buy it all back, and they got all these scrolls back, and they were able to ascertain that these were the most ancient writings of the books of the Bible that they've ever found in, in the world. And everything that they found that was, uh, in fact, if you see some of the dates, some of them dated back to 250 years before Christ, because as it was the rule, the Bible was deciphered regularly by the Jewish people by particularly the certain scribes. They would write out the books of the Bible, particularly the first five books of the Bible and the prophets, and they would continually write them out and they would hand down to generation to generation and they would continually copy, write, copy, write, and they would store these in earthen vessels. These were the oldest they've ever found, dating right back to 250 BC. Every book of the Bible, except for the book of Esther, was found in these caves. Isaiah scrolls to prove to be word for word exactly as we've got in our Bible from 250 BC. So what we're saying in giving you this slide is simply this, that what they found as an ancient manuscript, as an ancient scroll in 1947, lines up exactly with what we got here. So God deliberately preserved the translation of the Bible right throughout all the ages, right up to the day in which we live. And we can prove that because we found ancient manuscripts to, to show and verify that what we read here in the Bible today is exactly what Isaiah wrote when he was a prophet back in the Old Testament. It hasn't been touched, hasn't been manipulated, it is exactly as it is. So just put that, that to slide up so you can get a little bit of confidence to know what you read in your Bible. Even though we have different translations, predominantly the King James Version, the RSV, I think some of you have got that, um, or the New King James Version, are, are very, very good English translations of the original text of the Bible. All right, let's get into this stone. We said we we're going to talk about it tonight. This is it. Daniel said, and he's now coming to the, the crux of the whole dream that the king had, had, had dreamed, this vision that the king had seen. This is the part that really concerned the king. This was what he really wanted to know. What is this all about? I'm okay with what you said about that. Well, he wasn't because he tried to, as we said, build a whole image of gold. But he said, I can understand all that, but I can't understand what this stone represents. What does it mean? So the image is standing there. It's got a head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, 
feet part of iron and part of clay. It's looking rather menacing. It's looking at the king as he's laying on his bed. It's almost as if its, it's eyes are boring into the king's mind. And he's watching and watching. Next thing, his mind is, is adrift behind this image. He sees a mountain in the background. He sees this massive stone being cut out of the mountains, but no one's cutting it out because there's no hands, there's no chisels there. There's nobody doing the work. It seems to be happening on its own. And that stone comes hurtling across the valley to where this king is, uh, this image is. And he watches that and the image is struck on the feet by this massive stone. And then the stone grinds, the, the whole image falls to the ground. The stone grinds it all into powder. The wind blows all that powder away. And then the stone grows into something that fills the whole earth. This is what the king wanted to know, what it was all about. What does it mean? Thou sawest a stone that was uh, that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image on the feet, smashed that feet into a you know a million pieces, and then blew the, the all that away. And then it says in the next verse, and this is again what worried the king. The stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Open up your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2 because we started off in Daniel chapter 2 in seminar number 1. I'm not sure if I got you to actually colour in verse in there. There should be some colouring pencils on your, on your uh, desk. But if you come to Daniel chapter 2, which is on page 731 of that, this little Bible, has anybody got verse 44 coloured in in their Bible yet? Because if you haven't, I want you to grab a pencil and colour that in. Because we're going to get to that in a moment, but let's have it highlighted in our Bibles right now because we started off with that verse and we said, what does all that mean? I don't understand any of it. Well, tonight it's all going to make sense to you. All going to make absolute sense. Because like the king, the, uh, we want to know what this, this stone really means. Because the king did. What does it all mean? This great stone that grew into a power or into an entity that filled the whole earth. What does it mean? What does it represent? So that's found in verse 35, by the way. And uh, we've, uh, we've basically covered that. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken to pieces together, became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that there was no place found for them. So each of those particular metals represented a kingdom of men. All right? And that kingdom of men went through their basic uh, historical chronology and had their empires. And now all of a sudden, the stone power comes out, smashes the whole lot. Kingdom of men, all those representations of the kingdoms of men have been smashed to pieces and blown to the four corners of the world, never to be repeated again. Just out of curiosity, does anyone know what that is? Remember that? Remember that was a big image back in 1991, I reckon it was. Something like that. Saddam Hussein. All right, this is the toppling of a dynasty. Saddam Hussein was one like a lot of the Middle Eastern uh, countries that really love putting huge statues up of themselves uh, as their rulers. Remember I told you Saddam Hussein named himself the latter day Nebuchadnezzar. He actually thought he was Nebuchadnezzar uh, in reincarnate and his palace was built to overlook the old ancient city of Babylon and he believed he was like King Nebuchadnezzar who was back then the greatest monarch that the planet has ever seen. Well, Saddam Hussein was nowhere near like that at all, but he believed he was. And as a result of that, uh, he was able to uh, put all these great monoliths around everywhere and put these great statues up and, and people basically were supposed to revere him. Well, that's him come toppling down. All right, just like each of those particular metals, those particular uh, empires come crashing down. Well, not that Saddam Hussein ever had an empire, but this is what the people did. They'd had enough of him and they put a big chain around. I'll never forget that image. They put it on the back of a US tank and they drove off and bent this whole image over and all the people come smashing it with great sledgehammers because they'd had enough of this man's rule. 
Well, that's a sideline, I know, but just gives you a little idea of these things do happen in reality sometimes. Let's let the Bible unlock itself. Let the Bible tell us what this stone power represents. I'm not here to make it up. I'm here to go down in the Bible, delve out in the Bible, what this stone power, what this stone actually represents. The first clue is, it was a stone cut out of the mountain without hands, all right? This was something that was done not by human intervention. That's really what it's telling you. There was no humans up there cutting the stone out and putting it into a great big catapult and aiming it towards the, uh, the image. This was all done without any human intervention whatsoever. There's your first clue. So if it's not human intervention, what might it or must it be? If it's not human intervention, who's behind this next power that's going to strike the image on the feet? Yell it out, Mike. Did you, did you yell it out? Someone did. God. Well done. Don't be frightened to yell it out. If you get it wrong, don't worry. When I was your age, I yelled out more wrong answers than I did right answers, so don't worry, all right? I'm not here to say that's wrong. I'm here to say, hey, have another go. Or phone a friend, isn't that what they say? <laughs> and Lionel's over here, I'll give you his number. <laughs> so the bottom line of that is it was God. This is something, there's your clue. Your clue's not, it's not difficult to work it out. You don't have to be Einstein or a rocket scientist to work out that God's giving us a clue. Everything else was human intervention. You know, Babylon overthrown by Cyrus the Persian, or the Mede, and Medes and Persians came in and we saw how they took Babylon. And then Alexander the Great came along and overthrew uh, the Persians. Then along came the Romans and took over from where the Greeks left off. There was nothing after the Romans, so then we got a, a fragile environment of, of modern day Europe. That's all human, uh, uh, toppling human kingdoms, if you like, man kingdoms, toppling, toppling each one in succession that God said would happen because God's in control, he's making it happen. This is different. This is vastly different because this time there's no human intervention at all. This is a stone that is cut out of the mount without hands that comes and strikes this image on the feet. Now we've got some quotes up there. I'm actually going to look a few of these up because, and get your pencils out, because this is going to tell us who the stone represents. And I'm pretty certain some of you are starting to put two and two together and able to work it out. So there's the quotes, and by the way, a lot of this information is in your, is in your uh, seminar booklet, but uh, we're going to look some of this up anyway. Let's just go to Acts chapter 4. Who wants to find it first, and who wants to yell out the uh, page number? And I'm talking of this little Bible, not the Bibles that some of you might have bought that's not the same as this. Acts chapter 4. The writer of Acts was Luke. Luke was a doctor, he was a physician, and he wrote very, very powerfully concerning the works of the disciples and the apostles after the, the death and the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone got a page number of this Bible? Looks like all we've got might have our own Bibles. Well done, John. 908. Excellent. Acts chapter 4. Verses 10 to 11. Now, if you've got a pencil, colour it in. These quotes are worth colouring in. It's on the screen anyway, but colour verses 10 and 11 because this is our first clues to who the stone power is. Because Luke tells us, Be it known unto you all, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, Note the next words. This is the stone which was set at naught by you builders, but which has become the head of the corner. So he's talking about this stone that is representative by the Lord Jesus Christ, or probably better worded the other way around. Lord Jesus Christ is represented by this stone. Now you might think, oh, Bit of a coincidence. Is that the only quote you got in the Bible? Well, no, it's actually not. There's quite a few more. Here's a hard one for you, John. Can you find this quote? 
<laughs> Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20. If anyone's got one of these Bibles, they want to find Ephesians 2 verse 20. You can yell out the, the page number. Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul to the, uh, the, the uh, believers at Ephesus. And has anyone got a page number for me before I yell it out? 900, well done, Matty. 977. So if you've got that page open, page 977, colour in verse 20. So it's not one quote that talks about the Lord Jesus Christ as being the stone. Here's a second one. And, dare I say it, a third one. Ephesians 2 verse 20. Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone. There it is. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth. Now there's our next little clue because remember what happened to that stone. It struck, it struck that feet on the on the that image on the feet, and then it grew till it filled the whole earth. So here is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ as a stone that groweth, that grows unto a holy temple in the Lord. Uh, this quote is good, we won't look this one up in 1 Peter 2 verse 4 and 5 To whom coming as unto a living stone Disallowed indeed of men but chosen of God Oh that's a little echo of without hands isn't it? You know This stone was cut out of the mount without hands That means God was behind it Here's the stone here being recognised as the Lord Jesus Christ Specifically chosen by God for a specific purpose and to God he is very precious so there's another quotation you can put down of course we can keep on going we won't look these up but we're going to look up the last one in a minute Matthew 21 verse 42 Jesus said the stone which the builders rejected and he's talking here of himself the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvellous in our eyes. This is the Lord's doing. It's not man's doing. This is the stone cut out of the mount without hands. It's all originating with God, not with man. So this stone that Daniel described to King Nebuchadnezzar was cut out of the mount without hands. is hurtling through uh, the air. It's crossing over the, the valley and it strikes this image on the feet is God's doing. It's nobody else's but God's doing. He's in control of this. Now this last one, go to Luke 20. I mean this, if this doesn't top it off, I don't know what does. Who wants to yell out the page number of Luke chapter 20 verse 17? And I apologise if you've got different Bibles open there. <laughs> I'm just trying to work with those that have got the ones that they were given. Uh, Luke chapter 20. Sorry, what was that? 87. Well done. 871. Yeah, you're right, Sandy. 871. Actually, if you turn over, it's 872. You probably said that, but my ears are getting quite bad as I get older. 872. Now have a look at what this says, it's up on your screen. Here is your definitive proof that the Bible unlocks itself. You cannot escape this. We can go and run and hide, we can do what we like. God says it's all here, don't try and ignore it, don't try and run away. I'm in control, I'm bringing about the plan of purpose. And here's a definitive quote that finally tells us that the stone which the builders rejected, which we've already seen, is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, Whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now there is a direct link back to Daniel chapter 2 because the stone that hit the image, what did it do? It ground the whole image to powder, blew it away to the four corners of the world and then that stone grew into a, uh, filled the whole earth. So you can see where we're going with this and as I said, you do not have to be really clever to put all the pieces together. This is quite interesting. This is starting to open up into something that is now dealing with the age in which we live because this part of the image has not yet been fulfilled or this part of the, the uh, prophecy hasn't yet been fulfilled. So what uh, Daniel tells the king is that this stone smote the image, it became a great mountain and it filled the whole earth. Well, what does that mean? 
Someone is very popular tonight. <laughs> um, that filled the whole earth. Absolutely amazing. Well, this is quite. This is now going to bridge that little gap between. Where is this heading? I don't quite understand what it means. I'm getting there. I'm almost there. What does it actually mean? This is where Daniel 2 verse 44 comes in. You're going to have it coloured in. I hope you've coloured it in in your Bible because this is what it's talking about. This is the apex, the pinnacle, the absolute crucial point of this whole dream, this whole vision that Daniel gives to King Nebuchadnezzar is not so much for his benefit as it is for ours. Because guess why? We are living in the time when this is going to be fulfilled. Make no mistake about it. This is going to be fulfilled and you and I are going to be witnesses for this to be fulfilled. And I will show you that in subsequent seminars. It's all about God's coming kingdom. So what does Daniel 2 verse 44 say? The God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. It will break in pieces, consume all the kingdom of men. Anybody else that is in this earth that claims to have a political entity and a government and a kingdom, whatever, whoever they are, from the smallest to the greatest, they're all going to be done away with. And this kingdom that God is going to bring about will stand forever. And we've learnt that that is only going to be because the stone is going to smite that image on the feet and that stone represents the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to come back to this earth. He's going to come back to a divide into Europe. Not that he's going to land in Europe. That doesn't mean that at all. But that's the time frame in which it's going to happen. And he's going to smash that image to pieces and all the kingdoms of men in it, that image, that stone, is going to grow into a worldwide kingdom. Wow, we just covered 2,618 years of history and beyond, so it's not bad, is it? I mean, that's pretty, pretty good stuff. Well, it gets far better. That's just the basics of what Daniel had to talk about. And I think we have to really understand this is a definitive statement by God through Daniel, because he says it shall happen, it's, and that word shall is it will happen. It will happen. He says it four times, it will happen, it will happen, it will happen. It's not maybe, if, could be, it will happen. And the proof of that is, because Daniel said, and God gave him the, the, the interpretation of the dream, Daniel said, Babylon will come, the Persians will come, the Greeks will come. The Romans will come. They'll split into two empires, east and west. They'll be. They will finally come to an end. And the legacy of the Roman Empire and the form of the Holy Roman Empire, the Church, the Catholic Church, will continue on in a very unstable environment in in Europe. It's all happened. We've seen it. History testified to it. We're just waiting for the next part to happen. And that's we are on the edge of that happening. You'll see from the next few seminars that this is so close to becoming a reality. So the young man, Daniel, he gives this interpretation. He gives this uh, uh, the vision to the king and tells him what it's all about. And he says in verse uh, 44 that in the days of these kings, now each one of those lines there, there is a specific uh, acknowledgement of this particular uh, um, dream. For example, in the days of these kings, there's the date. What kings? Well, it's nothing to do with Nebuchadnezzar or Alexander the Great or Cyrus the Persian or the Romans. It's in the days of the kings where the stone hit, which is a divided Europe, a very unstable environment in Europe. There's the date. Like never before have we seen a very unstable Europe like we see today. Extremely unstable. All brought about, by the way, and Nathan, you mentioned this last uh, week, all brought about because they've tried the cohe cohesiveness, tried it some cohesiveness by bringing in the euro. It's been a disaster for Europe. And they are strong nations and weak nations, and they are almost toppling. They can hardly keep themselves above water, financially speaking. And God says, in the days of those kings, in the days of those rulers, in the times of those governments, I'm going to intervene and I'm going to send my son back to this earth and it's going to smash every kingdom on the planet and get rid of the whole lot of them and build into a worldwide kingdom that's going to be my kingdom. So we've got the date and days of these kings. Who's behind it? Not man. 
the God of heavens behind it. And what's he going to do? The event is going to set up a kingdom. The structure of that kingdom, it's never going to be destroyed. God's behind it. He's not going to allow it to be destroyed. And by the way, when you look at the Bible and see all the references to the kingdom of God on earth, of which there are over 300 of them made in the entire Bible, more than 300, you will also see a lot of correlating references that will tell you that the people don't want to ever go back to the old system. They would much rather live under a kingdom ruled over by Christ than to live under man's king, uh, rule again. So the structure, it's never going to be destroyed. The stability, the kingdom will not be left to other people because it's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ will be king over all the earth. The process, well, it's going to break in pieces the rest of the kingdoms of this earth. And yes, that does entail a pretty major, massive shake-up, the likes of which this world has never known before. All detailed very clearly in Bible prophecy. We'll probably touch a little bit on that in uh, probably our last uh, seminar together. Uh, the territory, well, it's going to be a worldwide one. It's going to consume all the other kingdoms. And finally, the duration, it's going to stand forever. I love this little section that Daniel finishes with when he says, you better know this, king. And he's not just talking to an ancient king that lived 2,600 years ago. He's talking to you and me. And he's saying, the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof is sure. It will happen. It will happen. And where do you think that this capital is going to be? Where do you think the capital of this kingdom is going to, to be? Well, it's not going to be in Rome. It's not going to be in Moscow. It's not going to be in Washington, D.C. It's certainly not going to be in Canberra. It's going to be in none of those places. The capital of this kingdom is clearly defined in the Bible as being exactly where we would expect it to be, smack bang, in Israel, in Jerusalem. And everybody says the conflict that's in Israel today, a lot of it is over who owns Jerusalem. And you will get a divided opinion if you ask anyone who owns Jerusalem. And you'll go up to some people and they say, well, the Arabs own Jerusalem. Palestinians own Jerusalem. You go up to some others and they say, no, the Jews own Jerusalem. You know who owns Jerusalem? God owns Jerusalem. It's his city. Yes, he's worked through the Jewish people to bring about his plan and purpose. We know that. But it is God's city and it's intended to be for everybody, not just the Jews. And it's going to be the centre of this new stone power, this coming kingdom. So I hope all this is starting to make sense because we've almost finished our, our slides for tonight. But I just want to um, go through a couple of other things so that you're fully aware of where we're at with all this and you go away tonight having learnt at least something. Um, well, we don't need to go over that again except, of course, we've got this uh, instance where we need to know is this happening now? Is it going to happen in 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, 50, 100 years? Is it going to happen in my lifetime? Well, we do know that this kingdom is coming. We do know that what Daniel says is repeated time and time again throughout Scripture. For example, in Revelation, and John, I was saying to you about Revelation, and Daniel go hand in hand with each other. In Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave John on the Isle of Patmos, he gave the, the visions of the Revelation, and he said, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. There's, there's really Daniel 2 verse 44. That's the revelation uh, summary of Daniel 2. That the kingdoms of this world are going to be done away with, swallowed up, smashed to pieces, blown away, and they're going to become the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is, of course, the Son of God. So it's going to become God's kingdom. So what have we learnt tonight? And Shannon... You just nudge Matty when you go out of here and say, I want to know a little bit more about this because he'll be able to fill you in on the details. And if he can't, Lynn and Fred will be able to <laughs> keep you on your toes, Lenny. Because uh, I don't expect you to understand because the Bible, to a lot of people, is just a massive book of hard-to-understand words written on white paper. It's, it may seem that on the surface, but once you get into it, you cannot let it go. It's just fascinating. It's really a wonderful thing. So the summary is this. The king had a dream, had a vision. It wasn't just a dream, it was in, in a, a massively impressive vision burnt into his mind. So when he woke up, he was worried. He was concerned as to what it meant. 
Daniel gave him the interpretation, not only what the dream was, but the interpretation of it, and he said that he only knew because God gave him the interpretation. And he outlined world history from the year BC 565, or roughly that era. He gave, uh, he gave this particular uh, king, King Nebuchadnezzar, a snapshot vision of world history that was going to happen. And he said, you're the most powerful kingdom on the planet at this time, King Nebuchadnezzar, you're represented by that head of, head of gold. After you will come another kingdom uh, uh, that's a bit inferior, it won't be as wealthy as you, but it doesn't matter, you're going to be overtaken by the Medes and Persians. Then would come Alexander the Great, the, the Greek, Greek kingdom, and they would follow. Then Rome would take over where the Greeks left off. There would never be another world empire, never has been, but there will be a very divided Roman, uh, um, sorry, uh, divided Europe, partly from the strength of the, the Holy Roman Empire, which came out of the, the Roman Empire as a religious entity and mixed with the clay, the democratic processes of the people, and it would be an unstable environment. So you've got strong nations and you've got weak nations, and we cannot believe how close we are to seeing that being the most closest reality is what Daniel would have seen it. We can tick these boxes, can't we? Because it's all happened. Go back, Google it, go into your history books. Everything exactly as Daniel prophesied would happen, happened. He was dead and buried well after all this happened. Now Daniel uh, really only got to see Babylon fall. He was an old man when that happened. He never got to see Alexander the Great. He never got to see the Romans. He never got to see divided Europe. He never got to see any of that. He was long gone and returned to the dust of the earth. He was way, way gone by the time a lot of these things happened. But we can tick them off because we're living here in the year 2013. We can go tick, yep, Babylon, tick, yep, Persians, tick, yep, the Greeks, the Romans came along. Hey, guess what? We're living in this terribly... Uh, unstable environment in Europe like we've never ticked before, like never seen before. Tick, we can tick that one off. Why wouldn't we tick the next one off? Or why wouldn't we at least be waiting to tick that one? Because if everything's happened exactly as Daniel said it would, then surely the next one's going to happen as well. Absolutely. It's going to happen, all right? The question is when? Is it going to happen? How far away are we that this is going to occur? Could it be this year? Next year? Could it be this month? We don't know the day or the hour, says the Lord Jesus Christ. But what we do know, the Apostle Paul tells us, is the approximate time period and we're going to show you in subsequent uh, seminars that we are living in that very time period. No doubt whatsoever. So to answer the question as to when this is going to be, we now need to direct our attention to something you and I can truly understand. And that is this nation here, the nation of... Does anyone know what that flag is? Yell it out. Israel. Israel. Well done. It's Israel. We can make, we, there's nothing, no better prophecy to go to now than the prophecies concerning Israel. In actual fact, we'll leave you with this last slide, or one more after this, I think. Uh, the, when you think about all the nations on the planet, and there's something like 250, 260 nations on this planet, there is no nation, none whatsoever, that points forward to the fact there is a God and that he is bringing about his plan and purpose. There's no other nation on the planet like the, planet, like the nation of Israel that proves to us that there is a God, he is in control, and he's going to bring about his plan and purpose. And we are going to, God willing, next Tuesday onwards, we're going to explore Israel. And this is something, this is now no longer ancient stuff, um, you know, for those that might not be totally aware of what the Bible really teaches. This is stuff we can all identify with because I almost guarantee you, you can pick up the Australian tomorrow or you can turn on the BBC tonight and you'll hear something about Israel. You'll hear something about Israel. And we're going to tell you why you hear so much about Israel. It's not coincidence. It's there for a reason. Israel is there for a reason. And you're going to be fascinated with these prophecies about Israel. Now, have you got a pencil handy? Because you've got some homework this week. <laughs> Treating you like school kids now, aren't I? 
I promise not to give you the cane. I don't think our young ones here would know what the cane was. Maddie, would you know what the cane is? I don't think they've allowed to smack kids now, are they? <laughs> I won't tell you. <laughs> Nate knows what the cane is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> your homework is to read a passage in Scripture, a chapter in Scripture called Ezekiel chapter 37. I can just see my son laughing here, Darren. He knows what the cane was, both at school and at home. <laughs> Page 715. Please read it. Please read that passage of Scripture. Ezekiel chapter 37. And you're going to read through that and go, wow, this is interesting, but I have no idea what it's about. There's a song actually was based on that chapter, Ezekiel 37. Ross, you'd know what that song is. But that's one of them, but there's another one. But, yeah, but there's another one. There's another one. I think it, I can't remember who sung it, but it was an old Negro song, the leg bones connected to the knee bone, the knee bones connected. You've all heard of that, Sandy? You must have heard of that song. It's based on this chapter. So read Ezekiel chapter 37, page 715. We look forward to seeing you next week, and you will be fascinated when we start now directing our attention to Israel because we've seen this whole outline of Daniel 2. We have understand the stone is the Lord Jesus Christ returning to this earth. Now what we want to do is put the other part of the jigsaw puzzle together. When is it going to happen? How close are we to seeing this all unfold? It's all going to be revealed, God willing, next